Welcome to the Homegrown Podcast, a place where we share the truth about food and farming from our kitchen to yours. I'm your host, Liz Hazelmeyer, along with my husband, Joey. Good afternoon. And together we hope to educate, inspire, and equip you in your pursuit of true nourishment. Today's guest is Vineet Dubey. Vineet is an environmental litigator who sues companies that are endangering the health and well-being of California citizens by selling products containing toxic chemicals. Because of Vineet's advocacy, thousands of products tainted with lead, cadmium, phthalates, and other cancer-causing chemicals have been taken off the shelves and cleaned up. And today we're going to be focusing on PFAS. So thank you so much, Welcome to the show, Vineet. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here today. I am excited to dive into a somewhat mysterious topic because the internet likes to hone in on, you know, kind of buzzwords. And I would say PFAS was a buzzword of 2023, which is exciting to see some awareness coming about, but I still think there's a lot of confusion. So can't wait to dive into that. Before we get there, though, I would like to hear how you even got into this line of work. Sure. Uh, you guys are in South Carolina, is that right? We're actually in Ohio. We're in the Ohio. Midwest. Ohio, okay. Yeah. Got it, got it. So I grew up in Mississippi, uh, okay. small town, had a great experience, really enjoyed it, was always interested growing up in civil rights work. And I thought I was mm. going to end up being a civil rights attorney. And I yeah. had a lot of friends that were white and black, and we were all in the same school, and we were all mixing, and it was kind of the new South, and it kind of showed you how the country had progressed in the place that I grew up. And I was very excited about that. And had, like I said, I had a great experience and I wanted to potentially become a civil rights attorney and help more parts of the country get to that level is yeah. kind of what I wanted to get to and went to uh, undergrad in Texas. I came out to UCLA to go to law school and ended up staying in California. And in my practice, starting to do litigation, I realized that through environmental law, I could really make a difference and touch everybody, yeah. right? And, and really help every segment of society. Uh, well off, not so well off, any race, any gender, you know, because if we fix the environment and we clean it up, then every single person in America is affected by that essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of shifted into environmental law and, and, and here I am, right. I found myself 10 years later, me and my partner have founded a, uh, this practice. And what I do is I sue companies that are bad actors, companies mm -hmm. that are selling products that contain toxic chemicals. And, you know, they're either not warning consumers they have it or, you know, they're just hiding the ball entirely. So that's how I got into environmental law. I really enjoy the practice. I think I'm making a very uh, a positive impact. Uh, we're holding a lot of bad actor corporations accountable and, and looking out for the little guy. And that's what I've always kind of wanted to do. Uh, PFAS, you know, we have only I personally have only began litigating these in the last year or so. And, and we can get into why that is because they're so hard to find. And, yeah. and there's a reason why these chemicals have been used for 40, 50 years. And you're just hearing about them since last year, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, the buzzword of 2020, 2023. Yeah. Uh, because we have just now been able to, the science has just now been able to find them, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is really scary and crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to break down like what the category of PFAS is for folks? Sure. So, so PFAS are types of chemicals and they're made with fluorine bonded atoms, essentially. And, and not to get too, too far into the science, but they were developed years ago by DuPont and 3M and, you know, these huge corporations. And essentially what they do is they make products waterproof and they make products almost indestructible. Mm. <laughs> okay. So, so things that are made with PFAS, firefighting foam, electronics, furniture, food packaging, waterproof clothing. Wow. And, and essentially if, if, you know, you have, the, the, they don't biodegrade, they're called forever chemicals because they last almost forever. So, mm -hmm. so for corporations, obviously this is great because they can sell products in packaging that will never fall apart. So the products will be kept safe, right? Or they can sell electronic goods and the, the chemicals that make up those electronics never come apart. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you're going to have an iPhone that lasts forever that can survive falling out of a plane and, and landing 3,000 yeah. feet, right? Mm -hmm. Like we just heard. Yeah. Uh, so for corporations, it's great. The, what's the downside of these things? The downside of these things is they cause reproductive harm, which means pregnant women who come into contact with them can have kids with birth defects. Mm -hmm. They also cause cancer. So long-term exposure to these chemicals cause cancer in humans. We found that out. and uh, you know, the, the scary part, the re one of the reasons they're called forever chemicals is because what you make with them doesn't fall apart. Secondly, 
if you get them into your system, the half-life of a PFI is, is 20 years. And so mm -hmm. what that means is once you get it into your system, it's floating around in your body, causing trouble, doing bad things for 40 years, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that's your, that's a large portion of your life. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're so scary and that's why they're so malignant and that's why they're, they're such a big deal. Uh, the reason they've been floating around for 40 years is that these, chem these, these companies made them so small, so microscopic that labs can't test for them. You can't find them, right? To find, to find a peep, the only labs that can test for them up until about two years ago were the labs at 3M and the labs at DuPont, these mm. crazy multi-billion dollar corporations that have the, the best technology we've ever seen. Even the government couldn't test, even the FDA labs couldn't test and find PFAS until just a few years ago. Wow. And the issue is to find PFAS, you have to test in the parts per trillion, right? So that's, I mean, you know, a lot, most of the chemical testing we do is in parts per million, parts per billion, even for certain chemicals, you know, and think about that, like a billion little dots and you're testing for 10 out of a billion, right? Yeah. So we have testing that can find that. And then you can find certain chemicals. But if you're doing that, you're not going to catch any PFAS because you have to go down to the parts per trillion. I mean, and, and it's, it's kind of mind blowing. It's hard to wrap your mind around how detailed that testing is to, to find those. Uh, like, for example, the EPA is, came out with you know, guidelines that are so hopefully going to be enacted soon about limits of PFAS in, in water. Mm -hmm. And the, the limits they want to set is four parts per trillion. So whenever you get a glass of water out of your tap, and if it was tested, the maximum you could have is four parts per trillion molecules of PFAS in that water. Just to show like how detailed and how, how crazy the testing is in order to even find the PFAS and where they mm -hmm. are. Well, and my like, this might be really uneducated, but my initial thinking is if they're sl so slow to degrade, yet we keep manufacturing at such a high rate, aren't we going to come across a point where we can't slow, like we can't turn off the faucet because they're just coming out? Like they're, they're going to be making these products that contain PFAS forever unless we stop that portion. And then it takes so long for it to get out of the system, whether that's in the ground or in your body. So we're kind of flooding our house with a bathtub that's plugged up and the faucet's just running, right? You know what I mean? And not to be a downer, but we, we may have hit that point already. I, I don't mm. know. They've been doing this for 40 years. Yeah. For 40 years, these chemicals have been put into the groundwater, have been put yeah. into the ground, have been put into these products that we're using, have been put into our bodies. And, and like, you know, we didn't know about it until three or four years ago. Yeah, that's why they're so ubiquitous. And that's why, you know, every day you're saying, oh, this food product has PFAS, oh, this packaging has PFAS, oh, this water, uh, oh, this soil, you know, because they've been doing it for 40 years and yeah. nobody has been able, you know, it's, it's so nefarious and, and evil genius. I mean, it's genius on their part, right? If you're mm -hmm. a corporation and you want to make this chemical and use it ubiquitously to make tons of money because it's a very strong component and it makes, you know, for them great products you make the chemical so small that nobody else can find it <laughs> and right. then you can use it for years and make billions of dollars and, you know, pollute the environment for that long. So, so I hope we haven't reached that level already. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we have, I think if we take a lot of governments get on top of things and everybody takes action to eliminate these chemicals, you know, hopefully the damage, you know, too much damage hasn't been done already. Mm -hmm. So like today, what is DuPont, who I'm pretty sure is an Ohio based company, if they're not in Cincinnati? Isn't that true? It sounds familiar, but I don't know I'm for pretty, sure. Because we're in Cincinnati, Ohio. I think Ohio. that might be right. I'm pretty sure right. it's like local, which is frightening. So like, what is DuPont and 3M, you said? What are these yeah. companies doing today? Are they being halted? Are they like, it seems like they should be not allowed to do these things, right? Yeah, well, government regulation has finally kicked in and, and they've made basically pledges to phase out the use of PFAS within ah. the next two years, right? And, and they're also paying billions of dollars out in lawsuit settlements. That's Ooh. another thing that's like caused them to walk back using PFAS. There have been these huge lawsuits about water systems all over the country and 3M and DuPont are, have already set aside billions of dollars to resolve these things. And, and that's how you really make them stop right when a huge corporation like that starts losing billions of dollars they say okay we have to do something else wow now here once again not to be a downer but what are they going to start using instead of pfas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you think their scientists the last 20 years have already been thinking about this and developing something else that we don't know how toxic it is and we're not going to be able to find out you know hopefully not uh but that's 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 where the government has to do its job right that's where the fda has to do its job mm -hmm. it's, it can't be 
you know, one lawyer out in California suing hundreds of companies. Cause yeah, that's great, but that's not going to fix the problem at mm -hmm. all. You know, it's such a big problem. It's got to be government agencies all over the world regulating these companies to make sure that the next thing they used, the next thing they come up with besides the next, you know, evil genius plan that they come up with, mm -hmm. you know, we know what it is and we stop it before it starts. Right. Mm -hmm. And once they start using it, we, we already can jump in and say, no, you can't use this either because it's causes cancer. Right. Right. So it's I a government it. thing. And that's, that's why I always, whenever I talk to people about this subject, whenever I write articles about it, I always tell people, you have to call your congressman. You have to get this on their radar. This is because this is the kind of stuff that matters, right? Out of all the stuff that the government does, whatever your political affiliation, this is the kind of stuff that's going to affect our kids and their kids and their kids. And, and really the future of the planet is regulating chemicals like this. Yeah. I want to I mean, know. So, oh, sorry. I cut you off. No, what no. did you say? No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I want to know the process of um, sort of your process when you want to work on challenging a company, I guess is how I'll say it nicely. Um, how do you become aware that a company is stepping outside of the guidelines or they're poisoning us through their products? Like, what does that look like for you? And how does that unfold? Sure. So, so I'm lucky to live in, in California in, in some respects. In some respects, it's, it's, you know, it's very expensive, it's, <laughs> sure. you know, et cetera, et cetera. It has its issues, but it has very strong environmental protections for consumers. And there's certain laws in California that make it easier to sue these companies. And, and you know, they should be federal laws. They should be mm -hmm. laws that the entire country can use. But it, they're, unfortunately, it's not. They're state laws. So I do a lot of work under one, one law called Prop 65. And there's another law that just took place January 1st of this year regarding PFAS content in food packaging. So because we have these laws, I'm able to work with environmental groups, some for-profit, some non-profit. And what they do is they'll test products, right? They'll, I help them find a lab and I find a toxicologist and they'll test products that we believe are potentially contaminated and they'll bring me test results. And once I have these test results, then I can go through the process of, of sending a notice letter and then filing a lawsuit. Mm. And the lawsuit's either on behalf of the general public or it's a class action. And, and that's what makes these companies, you know, become aware and, and start changing their practices. So once we have testing, once we have a toxicologist, look at that testing to determine that there's actual exposure to humans, right? Because some, some, if I just have test a product and say, Hey, this has lead or, Hey, this has PFAS in it. And I go to these companies, they're going to say, well, I mean, yeah, sure. It has it. But unless you can show that it actually exposes humans, the way we use that product, it's mm -hmm. not a great case to litigate. Mm -hmm. So we, we not only have to have testing, we have to have a toxicologist analyze the product and, and see how much real world exposure there is to consumers to that chemical. And then we're on strong footing, right? Then I can file a lawsuit. Then I can go to that company and say, look, clean this up within 60 days. Agree you're not ever going to use that. Take the chemical out, uh, pay civil penalties and a substantial amount of money, and then we won't sue you. And mm -hmm. if they don't, we file the lawsuit and we litigate and we get a judge involved and make a judge say the same thing to them after a year of litigation, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the process for me. Testing first, toxicologist analysis, and then we, you know, bring our actions against these these bad actor corporations. Totally. I want to know because I just saw something come out about uh, Stanley's testing positive for lead when folks were doing like an at-home test. And I've also had, um, I am... I am friends with the owners of a ceramics cookware company that the, they've had certain bloggers come out against them and say, hey, your, your cookware has, I tested it at home, it has lead in it. And they're like, listen, we're Prop 65, I don't know what you would say, approved, qualified? Compliant. We compliant. compliant. Yeah, we yeah. pass that every year when we have for the last 15 years. So my question is, is there a discrepancy when you do sort of like a DIY at home testing? And then also, is there a difference between testing for chemical presence and then testing for its ability to transfer and affect us as we're using that? Yes, um, on both. Absolutely. Yeah, so, Absolutely. So, on DIY tests, look, they're not that reliable. Let's just be, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. not. To really find out what's in something, you, you need to have an FDA certified lab that follows all these crazy protocols and does all this QC, QA, like quality control analysis. And those are the labs that, you know, I won't litigate a case unless I have testing from that kind of a lab because mm -hmm. it's not reliable, right? I mean, it's just not. If, if I, I don't know what kind of, I don't even know what kind of tests there are at home for lead, but, but they're not going to be nearly as reliable or stand up to scrutiny and litigation 
unless it's from an FDA approved certified lab that has, you know, scientists with 30 years of experience doing all this crazy stuff. Totally. You know, uh, and is there a difference between something just having a chemical in it and how it actually exposes a consumer? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, that, that's another reason why before I bring any kind of a lawsuit, you know, we have a toxicologist, who, you know, who's has all has the list of letters behind his name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And has been doing this stuff for 30 years to actually gauge how a normal consumers usage of this product leads to exposure and how mm -hmm. much exposure and whether mm -hmm. it exceeds limits that are allowed. So, yeah. you know, you got to have both, you know, and that's another thing. We, we you can't just every time something has lead in it, sue a company. Right. Uh, it's just not going to, you know, you just, there's, there's too many, and, but also it's not always dangerous. Right. I mean, just to be honest, there's, there's levels of lead in the soil. So, so a lot of things are going to have a little bit of lead, you know, and, and that's just the reality we live in. And unless it's dangerous, unless it's really exposing someone to these levels that are above their approved levels, then it doesn't make sense to go after those companies. Hmm. Yeah, there was a lot um, of chatter on social media last year. Some someone tested the KitchenAid. Um, the, it's like brushed the metal. Yeah. yeah, well, it was all of their stuff. All of them, okay. And they were like, this has lead in it. And then all of these um, primarily like women were calling the company and they were like, hey, your product has lead in it. Da, 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 da. And the company, of course, is like, no, it doesn't. It's fine. And part of me was like, listen, I get the concern to feel like you're duped, but are we wasting our time on some of these like smaller fires that in reality that led to what you're saying isn't actually going to harm you because it's never going to get leech out of that versus, hey, you have PFAS in your water supply you should be concerned about. If you're drinking tap water, that's that's more concerning than the lead showing up on that at home test from yeah. your KitchenAid. You know what I'm saying? 100%. Do you see that often? Yeah. I I absolutely agree with you. And, and I have to do for like, for me personally, right. There's only so many hours in the day when I'm at work that I'm doing these cases that I can devote yeah. to them. So I have to, I have to pick and choose. Right. And I can't, I'm not going to go after something that I don't think is really affecting people. I mean, if I have a good case where there's lead in baby food, right. Right. I'm going to file that. I'm going to spend some time doing that because that's, that's a huge deal. And that impacts kids directly and, and destroys their development. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I have a case where there's lead in some kind of a, product and it's never going to leach out. And I'm a talk, you know, toxicologist that says, look, it's never going to leach out. People are not going to be exposed to this. Then, then we shouldn't be, I don't waste my time on those. Right. Mm -hmm. My time is very valuable and, and I want to do as many good cases a, as I can and really make a difference. And that's not going to make a difference. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's going to make a difference is doing the PFAS cases. What's totally. you know, going to make a difference is doing cases about lead and food that people are actually consuming, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so yeah, I mean, you know, just, it's like anything else in life, right? You have to do kind of a analysis based on your time and your energy and what you can accomplish and, mm -hmm. and how to go about that and make the, the, the most change, right? With mm -hmm. those factors in play. In your experience with the toxicologists that you've worked with over the years, what, where do you see the transmission or, or ingestion? Like what methods of utilizing a product are the most effective at transmitting these, these chemicals or issues to us, right? Metals. It, re it depends on the product. It depends on the chemicals we're talking about. <laughs> you know, it, it's very kind of case specific. Okay. Obviously, obviously the worst are lead contamination in food because okay. that's, you're, you're directly consuming it. Right. Uh, but for example, you know, there's PFAS in, in certain food packaging. And, you know, that's, that's another thing that I just got into because that law kicked in January 1st of this year. So for example, a lot of paper-based food packaging products. So let's say you get, you know, not to, I'm not, not to say they're bad, but let's say you get macaroni and cheese, right. And it's mm -hmm. in, in a little paper cup and you can put it, we've all seen it at the grocery store mm -hmm. and you can put it in the microwave and you can heat it up and you can just, your kids or you can eat it right out of the thing, or you put it in a bowl. A lot of that food packaging, when it's heated up also allows more PFAS to get into the food. So, so if you have food packaging that's, that's paper-based, you know, that has PFAS in it, if it gets heated at all, that can mm -hmm. lead to more contamination of the food wow. inside of it. Uh, a lot of tools. I do a lot of cases with phthalates. Phthalates is it's another chemical that, that causes reproductive harm and cancer. And they're also ubiquitous. Phthalates are kind of like PFAS light. Okay. So mm -hmm. phthalates were developed to use in a lot of stuff, but like, you know, with PFAS, but they're not as strong. They don't last as long. They're just not as good from a, 
corporate point of view, mm. but they're, you know, in the grips of hammers, right? A lot of tools have phthalates in the grips. So you're going to oh, use wow. them, you know, wear your gloves, you know, anytime you're using tools is one thing that I tell people, it's small mm. stuff like that. Right. But after you're done, wash your hands very, very thoroughly, you know, with a lot of soap and try to get the stuff off before you go grab food and start eating it. Cause, mm. cause a lot of the contamination is it doesn't really hurt you necessarily dermally when you get it on your hands. But once you get it on your hands or on your skin, and then you reach for that apple and you start eating it, that's when, you know, you get more contaminated and that's when it's bad. Mm. And, and to almost answer, you answered that perfectly and I asked it poorly. So thank you. But the, <laughs> the, the ingestion would be like the number one concern, right? So yes. if you're ingesting this thing and some of the ways it sounds like you can, you can almost leach it out of products would be through heat. It sounds like so yes. if you've got like a cup of noodles, I'm thinking of, right? Like, mm. uh, um, I ate a ton like of the them, ramen. So, yeah, mm -hmm. but, but the, the, those sorts of things, and you talk about the mac and cheese, we can all see it in the, in the cup that goes in the microwave and you pull it out and then it's like, or you pour water. I don't even know how you do it, but I don't know. however, I know. And, and yes, um, cookware, look, cookware is a big, a big one too, that okay. contains a lot of PFAS. There's, uh, there's another law that, that I think it just kicked in in July of this year in California that said P PFAS have to be removed from any kind of cookware mm. because you know, companies used it because it helps it become nonstick and it helps things be waterproof and it helps, you know, so once again, it, it makes a product that for, from there it, it's, you know, you can use it a long time and it's not going to break and it's not going to mess up and there's not going to be a mess and you're not going to get shit stuck to it where you, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it makes a good waterproof pan, but, but unfortunately the, the side effect is that it could give you cancer. So, right. so that's another one and talking about heat, right? If, if cookware mm -hmm. has PFAS in it and you're cooking food every night or once a week or twice a week, that it's going to leach out into the food, right? Because mm -hmm. of the heat. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. You know, non-toxic cookware is like super important. Mm, yeah, I want to talk about that. I want to, I want your opinion on things. But you know, it's interesting as I'm hearing you give these examples. A lot of them are were invented for convenience. You think about your packaged food that you can just microwave. That's convenience. You think about your nonstick cookware, so you don't have to worry about the finesse of cooking in a stainless steel or adding extra fat to the pan or learning how to sear a piece of meat without it sticking convenience like teflon was created to be a convenient product a million percent stain and, stain resistant everything yeah. stain resistant right it's for convenience right so you so you can have products that just wipe off right right mm -hmm. so you think about we've traded you know yeah we don't have to work as hard to clean our pan but my goodness if you have a scratch in that pan are you causing are you are you exposing yourself to cancer causing chemicals i mean that's that's astounding so talk to me about cookware because i get this question a lot we have eliminated all nonstick in our kitchen we cook with ceramic we cook with stainless steel and we cook with cast iron where should people be looking in their kitchens for potential sources of pfas and what can they use instead and that look that's what we do in in, in our house we use cast iron and we use stainless steel yeah and and that's i mean you just said it that's what people should do right if you can do it, if you can afford to do it, do that. Use cast iron, use stainless steel. Don't use nonstick things. If you're going to use some kind of nonstick, uh, you know, pan, you know, make sure it has as many certifications as possible, non-toxic, you know, lead-free, chemical-free, you know, as, as, as much as you can see, if you're going to use one of those products, use the ones that are, that are certified mm -hmm. as non-toxic, right? Because mm -hmm. now, because I know California has a state law, but I think a lot of other states have kind of enacted similar, similar laws you know, for this type of cookware. Mm. So there are a lot of companies that are at least going through the, the protocols to try to make their pans as non-toxic as possible. So go for mm. those, right? Uh, but, but once again, like you said, stainless steel is better. Cast iron is, is better, you know, and, you know, the cleaning involved is a little more uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. intense with that kind of stuff. But that's, if you want to be healthier, that's the way to go about, you know, using those things. Mm -hmm. uh, put a filter on your, you know, on your tap. If you're mm. drinking tap water at your house, which, which actually now, I mean, we can talk about this nanoplastic bottled water stuff that just came out. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it could be better for you now to drink tap water than bottled water, <laughs> you know, which is kind of scary because for millions of, you know, for so long, people are saying, Hey, drink bottled water. If you think your tap water smells funky or if you don't think it's good. And everybody thought that was super healthy. And now we realize that it has millions of nanoplastics that once again, we couldn't test for because mm -hmm. we couldn't, you know, normal labs could not find things that small mm -hmm. until just recently. And, wow. and they just found out in the Washington Post did this big article about it, about how there's, you know, a hundred times more plastics in bottled water than we used to think there was because wow. we, could, we couldn't see it. We couldn't test for it. If you haven't seen that article, take a look. 
it's an I, interesting one. I uh, think I read the headline, but we'll make I'll find it and we'll link it in the show notes for folks. Yeah, because that's, so that's wild. So that's another thing. So so another way to make your kitchen safer is is drink tap water, but get a filter. Right? There are all these different companies that sell filters that you can either attach directly to the spout, or even better yet, they they're companies that sell them and you put them under, you know, just under where the water, where the cold water line comes into your sink. And mm -hmm. It just attaches and it's not, not crazy to do. And, you know, that's a great way to like kind of clean your water. Cause some of those actually filter out PFAS. I mean, they're so, their systems are so good. They'll filter PFAS out of the water and everything else that contaminates it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a filter at your house for water, people should look into that. I think. When I, you know, we've recently found a water filter. It's like a pitcher that you fill up, but it's called clearly filtered and they do claim to pay to filter out PFAS. My question for you is when they're making that claim as a company there, I'm guessing they have to test the water before and after it runs through the filter and they've got to use one of these labs that you're talking about that actually has the capacity to see the PFAS in it. Um, are there ways that companies can make claims that something filters out a PFA if it doesn't actually? Like, is that something we need to be weary of or should we, <laughs> or can we trust what they're saying? So my, so my firm, we have a, a few different departments uh, and, and I, I run the environmental law department and another uh, attorney we have here does false advertising consumer class actions. Mm. So the answer to that is yes, companies lie about things all the time, <laughs> all the time. And they make false and misleading statements on packaging all the time. Mm. And it's, you know, and, and some of it is so blatant. Like, for example, he just had a case against a, a supplement company that was selling fish oil. And they, one of their products was normal strength and one of their products was extra strength. And it had a big two times extra strength, two times the, you know, on the front label and the actual, you know, percentages, it was one gave you 800 milligrams and one gave you 1200 milligrams. And they charged you twice for the one that's supposed to be two times the amount, right? I mean, it's just very blatant, right? Like it should contain 1600 milligrams of that mm -hmm. supplement if it says two times the strength on it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just very commonsensical things that companies lie about. And, and they do it to make more money. So could those companies be doing that? You know, yeah, yes, absolutely. You know, and, and the only way to know would be to test that water after it's been filtered, you know, at an independent lab for PFOC content and see mm -hmm. if they're telling you the truth or not. Because yeah. mm -hmm. they could be testing it, but they could also be using some kind of tests that are very cheap uh, labs out of the country, right? They don't have the same regulations and don't have the same stringent measures on them. And, and then putting that claim on there and they can say, Hey, we have a test. Here's our test We're we're not, you know, we're not lying about it, mm -hmm. but the testing could be nonsense. could be garbage. Right. And mm -hmm. they're relying on that. And until some consumer group or the government actually checks that they can get away with it. Wow. And you know, they could with, in the case of PIFAs that are so small, they could be just using a test. that's not like the holes in the net are too wide and you just, you Absolutely. can't ever see them. So That's yeah, there's exactly no PFAS. Right. That's exactly right. If the, it parts per million, you're never going to find a PFAS. Right. If they're testing it parts per billion, you're, you're not going to find a PFAS. You wow. Know? wow. How is it getting into our water supply? Obviously when people like, like I think of firefighters, they've got to have such high exposure to PFAS. I wonder if there's health effects tied to them, but like say you're putting out a fire and the foam gets into the river. I understand that, but like how else is, how else are PFAS getting into our water supply? And it, was, it wasn't just the foam, it's when 3M have, has these huge factories that are making products, you know, making firefighter foam, making electronic stuff, making whatever. Uh, they used to just dump the waste from the factories into the rivers. They, wow. I mean, there was, there was a movie, what was it, Dark Waters, that yeah. Mark Ruffalo is an environmental attorney in that movie. And that was all about a huge case where I, I think, I want to say it was DuPont had a chemical plant and they were making PFAS and they were just dumping, literally, they were just, they had like a spout at the, at the end of the factory right. and they dumped the wastewater into the river next to the town and the mm -hmm. people were getting their drinking water from that river. And, you know, the incidence of cancer jumped, I don't know, 10,000%. Mm -hmm. And they had to have this huge settlement. But I mean, once again, these companies pay these huge settlements, but you have 600 people who get cancer already. What do they care about the money, right? And once yeah. you've ruined your life and your health, right? It's, 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 it's after the fact. So for years and years and years, DuPont and 3M and these companies have been having factories all over the country and they've just been dumping the remnants into the ground, into the soil, into the water. And that's seeped. I mean, literally that's seeped all over the country, right? Along with, uh, you know, firefighting foam seeps into the groundwater and, you know, 
but that but that was a major way is they they've literally just been dumping and you know and there had there hasn't been government oversight which mm-hmm. is which is very sad and and then like you know before we got on the podcast you were talking a little bit about you know the bio waste mm-hmm. that, that people are using for fertilizer right where people are you know re- repurposing and cleaning you know sewage sludge for for lack of a better term right and using it as a fertilizer and and a lot of that has PFAS so if mm-hmm. you're using that and you're putting it directly into your farms you know directly onto your crop beds and then foods growing out of there it's it's the food itself is going to have PFAS in it yeah. not even from packaging but just from the soil so that's yeah. another way that it's gotten into the gotten into the land <laughs> you know there's a great uh it came out in 2023 it was a i think a vice magazine did it and it was almost like a documentary but they published it on youtube and it followed several farms i want to say in michigan where they had accepted this quote free fertilizer aka biosolids and from whoever was offering it to them the epa and then found out later they had meat it was a cattle rancher had meat seized from their coolers and it tested so high for PFAS they had to stop everything now their land is completely ruined all of their customer base has to throw away the meat they have no food I mean it's it's destroying communities yes it's insane I'll link yes. that documentary too because I'm sure that's, people are going to want to see it but it's really like vice they, they used to have some great stuff on that yeah on that you know, I, I think was, it's some like really good in-depth reporting. I don't, I don't think they, they have it anymore, but I used yeah. to really like that. So this this was a great one. I, th- I think it's pretty recent. And it, it just shows you how it's almost unbelievable. I think that's the reason why consumers have a hard time changing their behavior is because if I were to sit down with some random person at the grocery store and be like, hey, listen, XYZ might be in your food and water supply, they're going to be like, nah, come on. We've got regulatory agencies. Like this is the US. Like we mm-hmm. we keep it locked down. And I, I would love to hear your opinion of that since you're in the space of like, no, really, we need to be conscientious consumers because there's a lot going on. We can't expect these governing bodies to check all the boxes. And like you said, sometimes the science hasn't even caught up to the manufacturing. And what are we manufacturing right now today that we're not going to find out about its repercussions until 20 years from now? Yeah. You know, so how do you have conversations with with people just every day of like, Hey, you need to be aware of this, not to, not to fear monger, but to have real education. How do you, how do you have those conversations? Yeah. I'll tell you exactly what I would, what I would tell somebody. And then, and then also I'd like to talk about more of the hurdles that people have though, actually trying to change their behavior and most of it's economic, right? Mm -hmm. Which is Mm -hmm. why, but, but let's, let's, I'll get into the first part of your question first. Uh, Here's what I tell people. Did you know that right now, there's no level set by the federal government for the amount of lead that can be in baby food. There's not, there's not a level. Wow. Wow. There's not, there's just not our government, the FDA, there's no level set that companies that Gerber, uh, nurture Inc. Beach nut. There's no level when they're selling pouches of baby food or little cans of baby food that you're feeding your, your infant. Mm-hmm. There's no level set by the federal government. There's no checking. There's no testing for how much lead is in that. Wow. So if you think the government's doing its job <laughs> and you think they're on top of everything, they're not, they're not. And to, once again, to me, that is like, what else should they be doing? That, that should be number one on the list, making sure that our kids have clean food, right? A clean mm-hmm. baby food. And, and there's this law, there's this potent proposed law that in two years, they're going to set a level of five parts per billion. And right now it's like a recommendation from the FDA, but it's not a law and there's no penalties and there's no, testing going on right Mm -hmm. so they're basically leaving it up to these corporations to sell these products and Mm -hmm. you know and say oh they're clean they're organic they don't have lead they don't have heavy metals but no nobody's watching over them and nobody's regulating it so if you think the government is is doing a great job regulating things think about that think about how important that is baby food (laughs) right during development and there's no federal level set for lead there was a recent case with with baby food was it abbott Formula? Um, formula. They, they make uh, Pedialyte, Pediasure, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that was recently, that, that recently happened. And, and I know this because I was, was friends with one of the people in the market research. She's, she's left, but in the market research side of that company. Wow. And they were going through a major, major lawsuit. And, what, and it, I can't remember what it was, though. There was something about their factory being. The factory was contaminated and it, and it wasn't, they had a bunch of bacteria and it wasn't cleaned oh properly, my. essentially. And it contaminated 
a bunch of lots of Pediasure, right? Or oh, formula. Right. And a bunch of kids got sick. A bunch yeah. of kids got sick, right? Uh, wow. So, you know, so once again, regardless of your politics, to me, that's the kind of thing that Congress and the president need to do. That's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of laws that we need to have in place, and that would actually help all Americans, right? Because mm -hmm. everybody has babies, <laughs> whether you're Democrats right. or Republicans or whatever. You all right. have kids, and everybody wants their kids to be healthy, right? Yeah. And everybody needs their kids to not get lead poisoned so that they develop properly. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say to somebody that thinks the government is on top of it. Just look at that. Look at that basic thing. And, and if, if they're not on top of that and they're not regulating lead and baby food, you know, do you think they're regulating all this other stuff? Do you mm -hmm. think they're on top of it? Do you think they're doing enough testing? No, they're not. That's why you have to be a conscientious consumer, right? Yeah. Now, what's the flip side of that? The, the hard part of that, you know, you know, my family, you know, we get, we get all our meat, we get all our eggs, we get all our chicken from farmer's markets, right? Mm -hmm. Like we go to a farmer's market, once, you know, and a bunch of fruit and, and we, we very organic, very healthy from farmers that are local. Right. But, but who can afford to do that? Right. right. It's expensive. It's, mm -hmm. And I have, I have two little kids and they eat a lot and it's, you know, it's, it's, they're growing boys. Let's put it that way. That's not yeah. like a stereotype, you know? Right. And they eat a ton and, and it's mm -hmm. very expensive for us to be able to do it. Luckily we're able to do it, but, it's hard to tell other consumers, right, that are on a budget or struggling or it's everything is expensive right now because of inflation. It's hard to tell them, hey, don't go buy that chicken from the market, you know, mm -hmm. even though it's true. Don't go buy, you know, those eggs. Don't get that fruit from there. Go spend more money because it's healthier for you. Mm -hmm. Some people just can't physically do it right. That's why it's even more important that, that the government oversees these huge corporations that feed the vast majority of Americans, mm -hmm. right? The vast majority of Americans, we get our food from these huge corporations, right? From, you know, the, the same, if you really look into what companies own all the brands, you know, right. it's like five companies own everything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. For, it, it just, it's, that's just the way it works now. Everything has become consolidated, right? So that's, it's, it's a government thing. The government has to get in there and make sure that food products that are being sold to, to the vast majority of Americans you know, are healthy and don't have mm -hmm. PFAS and don't have lead and this kind of stuff. So, so you know, I always kind of, I feel like a broken record when I talk about this stuff, but it's, it's all about the government. This is something they have to do because it's such a big problem. Private industry won't clean itself up. Private lawyers like me can only do so much. Right. It has to be like a government, the only entity that has the funding and the ability to do stuff on like such a big scale is federal government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You it's know? such a, it's such a double edged sword because it's like really wide food distribution it sounds like a wonderful idea. Yes, let's make sure everyone has access to food. But then you get into the nitty gritty of what happens when that really wide distribution causes the food quality to suffer so much. And yeah, that was going to be my other question is like, well, is there room in the private sector for companies to come out and self-certify and, and sort of educate the consumer? But every time you have a company that emerges like that, you're talking about a premium dollar. You're talking about a higher price point. And deservedly so. I'm not saying we shouldn't pay companies who are doing well, but that doesn't solve the question of well, what do we do for everyone? What do we do for folks on welfare, folks on WIC, folks who are um, their only option is to purchase food? And, and I actually think it's an amazing thing. There's a lots of programs that allow folks who are on tighter budgets to still have access to real food. You can use your EBT cards at a lot of farmers markets, but even just flipping that out, throwing that out there sounds flippant. I know that food is really big struggle when it comes to families' finances. So it's this tension of like, let's be an educated consumer. Let's demand more from our government regulatory agencies. And then let's also open up space in the, in the like, private sector for companies who want to come out and show us that they're willing to go the extra mile to make sure that their products are safe. And the market will help them decide. Those who can afford to support those companies hopefully would do so. You know, so it's, it's, it's a, to me, it feels like a very mixed solution we'd have to call on. Um, when it comes and it's to- it's complicated. Think, think about yeah. all the issues you just raised. Right. And, and all the issues that come along with all, you know, all of that, the economics of it, the feasibility of it, the, right. the government intervention, the private sector trying to do certain things, making sure the companies that claim they're a certain way are a certain yeah. way and they're not false average. Like it's, it's complicated stuff, you know, totally. there, there's no, there's no easy answer, it, you know, for all that. It's mm -hmm. you know, the economics of feeding this many people in our country and making sure everybody has access to food. 
and you know and how does that affect whether it's healthy or the quality and you know it's it's very complicated stuff <laughs> it is complicated that's one of the reasons why i really enjoy seeing people who have little and they make the most out of it. I'll never forget. I have a friend who runs a farmer's market and she said her very best customer is on welfare and he comes every single week and he buys everything from them. And he like walks a mile to get there. And those stories are so inspirational to me. I know that's not representative of everyone's reality, but even just this like general homesteading movement that we see, everyone kind of jokes about like wanting chickens in their backyard. We don't have chickens in our backyard, but like even the idea that Americans can start to produce some of their own food, I think is really, really helpful and beautiful as long as it doesn't become this, I just want to hop on a trend and have a certain aesthetic. You know, I don't really care about that. I just want you to feed your family as well, however that looks. Totally. I also, I don't want people that don't have, you know, a, a, a really free amounts of money to spend on upping their game. Like, I think there's, there's two approaches. We've totally. talked about this a bunch of times. Yeah. There's one pr approach to a real food journey. And that approach tends to look like a financial approach wherein I throw away all of my pans. I buy all new ones. Mm -hmm. I throw, it's like, you know, I, I completely change my grocery budget. And when I buy my meats, it's at a higher price tag. So having it shipped in from, you know, wherever it's, that, that is, that is a financial approach. There's also, an, there, there's also a time approach where you can spend time you don't have the you don't have the, the the budget. Maybe you have no budget for this. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage those people start somewhere. Start by educating, learning. Uh, that like if you're listening to this right now, then I know at least you have some access to the internet. Mm -hmm. And there's so much information and things you can learn. Even listening to someone like Vanit talk right now, yeah. right? You are learning things that you can take into your everyday life. And when the time comes to swap out or man, my my nonstick pan is time to go. Well, guess what is really similar in price to a nonstick pan. A cast iron pan, yeah, cheaper right? actually. You, you could buy right, a yeah. cast iron, and guess what? If you're if you're if you're looking to to really watch your budget with with your you know, the things that you're purchasing, well, buy something that's going to last forever, yeah. like like a cast iron yeah. pan, right? Yes. Or a stainless steel pan, right? These, these things last forever, mm -hmm. and you're going to be protecting yourself, like we were just talking about, from some of those things might leach out. Man, I can't afford the the you know fifteen dollar eggs, right? But it, but I know enough to know that. Man, these eggs are better for me than the pop tarts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's some things that maybe there's some trade offs that I can make, and that education will go so much further than than just just you know kind of like falling down and saying, you know what, there's no hope for me. Mm -hmm. And and I would tell those people that don't have the budget, man, there's hope. Yeah, there is so much hope. There's we we do we live in a broken situation where there's just so many things working against us. I mean, Vinit just said right here on this show. There is no limit to the amount of lead in baby food. And so many questions came to my mind. Like, are we talking like formula? Are we talking like jars? Like, what, what are we talking about here, right? Like, that's concerning, right? But man, it's, it's this idea of being an educated consumer. And like, I flip the label around. That, is, that, that goes a long way. Knowing what to look for. What am I reading? Why am I looking for these things? Why am I considering what kind of package this was put in? You know what? Like, I'm going to skew towards more of these, you know, glass packages. I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying these sorts of things uh, come to mind for me in this mm -hmm. situation. Anyways, I'm really passionate about the the budget thing because economically there's some major barriers um, and a, a huge passion of mine is like, well, what can we do? Mm -hmm. And I think education is a big part of that. I, th I think that's awesome, man. Because look, even, even making small steps today, right, of what you can actually do leads you to, to, to a healthier lifestyle and leads you mm -hmm. to maybe being able to do different things further on down the line if your economic situation changes. So what you exactly. said about mm -hmm. do what you can do, become more educated at a minimum, right? Mm -hmm. That's huge. That kind of stuff, right? Take a little mm -hmm. more personal thought about what you're eating and what you're buying and learn about stuff. That's the mm -hmm. first step. And I would also say, tell that story about that person who walks a mile and uses his EBD card to get food at the farmer's market. Tell that to more people. Tell mm -hmm. that story a lot because there's so many stereo just on a tangent, right? There's so many stereotypes about people that receive government aid and, and government help. And still people think they're lazy and they don't give a shit about anything. And, and that's, I don't think that's the case for the vast majority right. of people that get aid. I think they're trying and doing the best that they can and they have hard situations and it's tough and life's hard. Mm -hmm. So I would say, tell that story to everybody, you know, tell mm -hmm. that a lot more because that's the kind of thing people need to hear. And, and that, that kind of thing will change some, some minds about, about different people, you know? Totally. Yeah. Pride is real, right? Yeah. And it can it can flare up in negative ways for sure, 
I do it all the time. But pride also is is a is a is a real human behavioral like trait. Everyone has it. And to think that people that that are having a hard time in one way or another, whether it be finances or marital or family or health or whatever it is, to think that pride isn't isn't there. That's that's from like an empathy practice, right? Man, um, you think that you think they don't care that they're they're in this? It's yeah. it's it's. it's I, I'm with you. I think the vast majority of people, man, that if if they could figure a way out they would. Mm -hmm. And so you have the story of the person walking a mile to get to the farmer's market to buy awesome food because they want to you know, improve their health. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of years from now, she's like, well, now he drives here, you know, mm -hmm. or totally. yeah. I would not be totally. surprised. Yeah. Agreed. It goes back to that uh, really controversial episode we did of our people doing the best they can with the tools they currently have, but you know, it's fine. We won't go back to there. Uh, <laughs> I would love to know, Vinny, just since you are like in the industry, how does this affect your everyday consumer habits? What are things you're looking out for? What are things you might be avoiding? I know you talked about your cookware, but I'd love to hear kind of lifestyle wise. How do you, how do you approach life? Yeah, we're, we're, you know, in my household, me and my wife. And so I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, right? So they're little and growing and, and just learning about food habits and food and, and the stuff, right? That's, that's going to stay with them for the rest of their life. And yeah. And we're, we're big on real food, right? We're big on non-processed stuff. We try to stay away from packaged, packaged goods, right? Ultra processed, processed to the greatest extent possible. You know, we always go organic when we can. We, we try to buy local from, you know, food growers. And, and look, once again, another good thing about California is there's so much agriculture here, mm -hmm. right? So you go to the farmer's market and there's, there's, you know, every week around our area, there's, you know, there's a, a different farmer's market in a different little city that you can go to. And they have local, you know, local goods, local fruit, local vegetables, local chicken, local meat, you know, so that's good. So we do a lot of that. You know, we stay away from plastic products as much as we can. Uh, you know, just kind of an overall whole food life, real mm -hmm. food. Like you said it right earlier when you said real food, right? Mm -hmm. We're big on that. We're huge on that. And and it's it's made us healthier and, and my kids are growing great and and, you know, just trying to teach them good habits about real food and stay away from the processed stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Stay away from anything ultra processed, uh, you know, stay away from too much plastic stuff. We, we keep all our nuts and fruits and seeds and spices. My wife cooks a lot with spices in glass containers, right? Mm. Uh, because, and you can, and look, you can get them at Ikea and they're not expensive. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they fit in everybody's budget. You can get these little glass containers and keep all your stuff in them. And then you're not going to be worried about plastic leaching into the food, leaching into mm -hmm. your spices leaching into all your stuff, right? Some more glassware or something we do. Uh, you know, that's that's about it. Kind of, a, you know, real food, organic approach to things, local mm. whenever we can. Uh, I think that's a big deal. And because that also, you're supporting the local economy and you're allowing farmers to be able to do what they do and, and still serve people around here, which is the other component of it, right? So much of it is economic and you got to make sure that that people can afford to sell good, healthy products to you and you can and still do it and you mm -hmm. can, they have a market for it and then people can buy it. Mm -hmm. So we try to support local as much as we can as well. I love that. I tried to, I used to be better. I think it's easier in the summer to spend about 50% of your weekly budget on local because it's, there's just so much more abundance in the summertime. Um, in the wintertime, it's a little harder, but, but that's really a goal of mine is like, I really want to impact my local food economy, my local farmers, even that's, even if I would consider local up to two hours away, but still w much closer than, you know, shipping in oranges from California. Um, and then, yeah, doing the best you can with what you have. I, I think that's really, really helpful. I, I wonder too, did you have any um, was anything hard to give up for you or ha have you ever come across a case where you're like, man, I didn't see this coming and I've, I found lead, cadmium, PFAS, whatever in an unsuspecting place that really bums me out because now I have to give up that thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not me personally, but my, my partner, Miguel, he, so we, he, uh, real into supplements and, and, and being healthy and whatnot. And then when we found that athletic greens, that, that, you know, that, that AG1, thing that, AG1 that they market, mm -hmm. it's got bad stuff in it. It's got lead no. in it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Wait, and, tell me, I need to hear these details because everyone raves about AG1. I would take yeah. everyone's podcast sponsor. I know we've, we've 
we've tested, you know, quite a bit of it and it contains levels of lead that, it, that exceed the levels that California says you can have in, in a daily serving. Uh, yeah. And so, and, and they actually have, so one, one of the ways in prop 65 that you can you comply with the law is you put a warning label on the product. So people know, right. So consumers, cause a lot of this is about consumer awareness and being mm -hmm. an educated consumer and making your own decisions and, and personal responsibility and all that stuff. Uh, and so they actually have tucked away on their website. They have a little Prop 65 warning that says this product contains lead, blah, blah, blah. And, and they have another section on their site that says, oh, we just have that on here because California's crazy and they make us do this. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they have it on there because they're, it contains lead and levels that are higher than you're supposed to have in a day. So when he found that out, he gave them up and he was super bummed about it. Wow. <laughs> you know? Super bummed because, you know, he thought he was doing something super healthy for him every morning, you know, and, and drinking a glass, AG1 and getting all the nutrients, but you're also getting lead, you know. And so, where is that lead coming from? Is it in the actual like herbs and greens or? Where, yeah, like... it's another, it's another soil issue. It's another okay. issue where, where they're procuring all the herbs and the greens to, to make their, their mix. That soil is contaminated with lead. So wherever mm -hmm. they're getting it from, and it could be, it's a global problem, right? So it could be outside of the country. It could be inside mm -hmm. the country. There's contamination all over the place. And apparently they're not requiring testing of that soil where they're getting you know, their, their greens for their mix, or they're, they're getting it tested and they don't care or whatever, right? whatever they're doing, you know, they're getting components that have lead in them and then they mix them up and put them in their mix. So, mm -hmm. so that was a big one. Like that was the one where, you know, he found out about that and he was super bummed out about it. Uh, yeah, that's surprising. Yeah. And really it's, it's bad because you're also thinking you're doing something so good for your body, right? It's not like you're eating a cheeseburger and you're like, oh, I know that's not really good for me, but I'm going to eat it because I love it. Right. And, and have one occasionally. You're thinking, man, this is going to help me every single day. I'm getting nutrients, you know, and you're also getting lead at the mm. same time. So how, how, how exceeded is the lead level to what we should have every day? So this is like more lead than you should be exposed by any other product. Yeah. So, so essentially what, what the California, and once again, California is one of the only states that has any kind of a standard for this. Mm -hmm. so that's why I can bring a lot of actions in California, because there's a level set, right? Because if there's no level set, I, I can't go to a court and say, hey, this is unhealthy or this is healthy, right? Mm -hmm. But if there's a level that says, hey, you can only have, and in California, it's 0.5 micrograms a day. So there's any product, and I actually think it should be way lower than that. And I think they should look at cumulative, how many different products have lead in them. I don't think it's a great standard, but it's something, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially any product can expose you to more than 0.5 micrograms a day. And what we found with AG1 was it's triple, three to four times that in one serving. So you're getting about 1.5 to two micrograms of lead in each serving of, of that product. So it's way, you know, it's not even close. You know, it's not even they're like, oh, we're at 0.6. <laughs> we're pretty close. You know, so, it's three to four times. And oh, so they put their label on their website, but they don't have to tell you, hey, we're exceeding no, California because no, no, no. it's not federal. It's just California. And it's so yeah. easy to just say, hey, California people are crazy, right? It's what everyone in the States does. They literally have language in their FAQs on their site that says something like that. Oh, we just have to put it on there because California has these crazy laws, <laughs> you know? So, uh, and, and, wow. and that's why I'm like, so when you asked me that question earlier about would a company ever claim that <laughs> their filter actually works when it doesn't, I, I'm mm. very skewed. Uh, you know, because of the work we do, because of mm -hmm. how many companies we have to sue that are selling dangerous products, that are selling toxic products, that are that are selling products with misleading advertising, just false statements in general. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's why I'm very wary of, of big corporations in general, because uh, just, you know, I see it every day, mm -hmm. every day in my work. I see companies lying to people and selling toxic goods and trying to get away with what they can to make to make money. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're doing it. Right. They want to sell more goods. And they want to sell cheaper products. And a lot of these cheaper products contain all these crazy chemicals. Do you think so there's economics involved once again? Totally. <laughs> in, this whole, in this whole cycle of, of nonsense, right? Right. Do you think if like, could we say someone like me who lives in Ohio and I don't have all of the same local regulations, could I look at California as a filter to say, hey, if they're Prop 65 compliant, this is a safe product or yes. so is that a good tool for consumers to use or maybe explain exactly what prop 65 is saying too because i think there's some confusion absolutely so 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 it basically has a list of like 
I don't know, 700 chemicals and all these chemicals, the state agency has found that they either cause cancer or they cause reproductive harm. So mm. if you're pregnant and you get exposed to these chemicals, potentially your child could have birth defects. And, you know, basically what the law says is if a company is selling a product with a chemical that exceeds like the daily, where exposure to that chemical would be over the daily allowance set. So that's where it goes back to toxicologists, where it's not just it contains this chemical, mm -hmm. but if regular usage exceeds this daily standard set, then you have to either not sell it anymore, you have to remove the chemical in its entire, entirety, or you have to place a warning label on the product that says warning, this product contains this chemical. So consumers are aware at least, right? So it's kind of a consumer awareness thing at its, at its heart. And so, yeah, so if you're in Ohio and you see some products that have that Props because you have a warning label on it, I, I would stay away from them. I would pick a product that doesn't have that label on it. Because the good thing about, even though it's just a statewide law, California has such a huge, huge marketplace that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if companies have to add a warning label or change a product because of California, they're going to do it for, a lot of times they're going to do it for the whole country, for all the products that they ship around. They're going to make the factory do it before they ship products to anywhere in America. Hmm. That makes so, yeah, sense. Got, you know, I would, I would, right? Like if I'm, I tell people, a lot of people say, oh, it's, Prop 65 has led to like overwarning and there's warning labels everywhere and, and it's, it's saturated consumers. But I, but I still tell them, look, if I go to a, a store and I see one bag of spices that says warning contains lead and I see one that doesn't, I'm going to buy the one that doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make that decision and potentially make myself healthier, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to get a tool or a hammer and one says it contains DHP and there's another one that doesn't, I'm going to get the one that doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to, that goes back to what you were saying. Do, do what you can with what you can, right? Do it. And, and knowledge is everything, right? If you have mm -hmm. knowledge about things, you can make better, more informed decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Is it just things that are manufactured in California or is it things that are sold in California? Sold. 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 So, so which, is, if, which is good because things can be manufactured anywhere in the world. Okay. And if they're sold in California, they have to comply with these regulations. Okay. That was going to be my question because like maybe yeah. your spices came from a different state that didn't have to pass that regulation. But if that same brand is also sold in the state of California, it would have to comply. Right. Good to know. That's right. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. I don't know how you don't carry a level of skepticism, honestly. Like I, I think I would feel the same way of just being in that space and being, everyone's lying being duped you know yeah no not everyone's lying everyone's but lying. That, that's got to be hard but look i'm i'm not a i'm not a negative guy. i'm an optimist i'll tell so you i'm a true. very positive guy i'm an optimistic guy i, I see the I, i'm really a, a cup half full mm -hmm. and that's the way i live my life and I, and I do that and i have so much to be thankful for and you know so much to to appreciate in my life and and being an american and growing up in this country and having what we have you know and Everything that entails, along with the downsides of it, there's so many positive things, right? I'm an optimist, and I think we can change these things, and I think we can still clean up our environment. And I think, you know, not just my, I think not just my kids, but hopefully their kids and their kids can enjoy the environment and enjoy what we have, and and you know, still live a good life. And I think we can still do it, right? Mm -hmm. So even with all this craziness, right? Even with all this corporate malfeasance <laughs> that we see, I still, you know, I'm an optimist. I'd still try to stay positive about things. I'm skeptical about things, but you know, it doesn't depress me. I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. I don't wake up just sad about life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, like you can't, that. you can't, you know, you have to appreciate what you have and still, you know, keep, yeah. keep, keep kicking. Right. <laughs> so we talked about PIFAs, lead, uh, uh, phthalates, I think. And then we phthalates, talked about yeah. one other, it was, you said it like on the tools, just curious what, what, um, for your work, I'm, I'm actually just curious about, and I'm probably just going to ask questions until, until you tell me, I don't want to talk about that anymore, but I'm just really <laughs> no, no fascinated by, by your actual work. Right. And so, um, one first question that I kind of written down here is, you know, what are all the different chemicals, that, that you're dealing with on a regular basis. I mean, maybe it's too long of a list to, to talk about, but um, I, I named a few of those. I know that you're more recently into PFAS, but mm -hmm. what else is out there that you're, that you're really working against currently? Yeah, that, that's, that's the main crux of the practice is I do cases with lead. Uh, I do cases with phthalates. And so phthalates incorporates DHP, DINP, DBP, and, and they have these long chemical names. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do a lot of phthalate cases. And once again, those are like PFAS light, essentially. Mm -hmm. They're plasticizers. They're using all, <laughs> all kinds of plastic goods, and they're just not as strong, and they don't last as long. And, That's good. You know, but they still hurt you, right, which is not mm -hmm. great. We just started doing PFAS cases 
Uh, there's another chemical called diethylamine that I do some cases on. And it's a chemical that is in a lot of like shampoos and mm. uh, sunscreen and lotion. And once again, this is something that causes cancer. And if it's in your shampoo, you're going to use it every single morning, right? Or if it's in your lotion, mm -hmm. you're going to use it every single day when you get out of the shower or however times, you know, you put on lotion. So that's kind of a scary one too, because it's like just direct contact every single day. So in yeah. terms of like exposure, that's a bad one. Uh, but that, that's kind of, those are the major ones that, that I'm dealing with. So my follow-up question to that is, and, and whatever you're able to share, are there cases that you've worked on from these different uh, chemicals that would, to give people kind of like a reference point? I mean, we talked about the AG1 which for, for lead, which I think is a great example of, it's, sometimes it's hard for me to visualize. And I think even just like examples of cases that maybe you've worked on or, or that are you're aware of that would give people an idea of like, man, I'm looking at this shampoo. Are we talking about like some off Swap. brand or are, are, are we talking about, you know, like Procter and Gamble, right? Right. Yeah. We're, we're talking about Johnson and Johnson and Procter and Gamble and, and, you know, Bondi, I have a lot of cases against Bondi, that brand. I don't know if you've seen Bondi. it, but it's like a, it's like a sunscreen lotion. Okay. A lot of those, uh, I had a lead in, in like toddler food case and it's nurture ink. They did mm. the Happy Tots brand, mm, okay. and so they they are working to clean up their products now because of the lawsuit. So that was that was a big one, and it was like a little thing of uh, I want to say it was mac and cheese, and then mm. another thing of like ravioli that comes for you know for the for Happy Tots, right? So mm -hmm. for toddlers, so that was a pretty big one. Uh, you know, in terms of of PFAS, a lot of food packaging cases, so. I have a lot of cases right now going uh, a few cases against target their paper plates and paper bowls we think exceeds the level that is allowed for pfas mm. wow um so I mean, it's big companies that we're yeah. going after we're not going after the small guys here you know yeah well i have a ton i would say i mean i don't <laughs> i have a ton of phthalate cases uh for products that were bought at ross or tj maxx mm. those places are just chock full of poisonous chemicals uh so, you know, do with that what you will, right? So it's all over the place. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah. Is it because they're, they're sort of like, it's not a secondhand store, but TJ Maxx is like a stuff that didn't sell on the shelves. They sell, right? Is, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. And like, and Burlington Coat Factory as well. Yeah. They, they have a lot of the, yeah, they have a lot of stuff that like leftover inventory. Yeah. They get, yeah. right. They'll get a couple of lots of, you know, goods that didn't sell elsewhere and, and a lot of it's like, you know, kind of cheap plasticky stuff mm -hmm. that contains a lot of phthalates. Mm. Shoot. One year we did all of our shop, all of our Christmas shopping at Burlington Coat Factory. You remember that? I wasn't there. No, you and me together. Yeah, we did. <laughs> was I? Yeah, we bought for our kids. This was like three or four years ago. And now Burlington I'm... Coat Factory? Yeah, because they have like it's confusing because they're a coat factory, but they've got all they got of stuff. skincare. They have, they have of... bags. Yeah. yeah oh, clothes. I do remember yeah. that. Yep. I so that's interesting. Backpacks and backpacks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and mm -hmm. boots. So and... Now I'm thinking like, okay, it, and man, paper. I, for some reason, I always assume like plastics the absolute enemy, and everything paper is clean. But twice now, you've mentioned paper products containing PFAS. Is it because of the coating on the paper? Yeah. Like I've heard a lot about the coffee cup, right? Like the paper cup that everyone gets their coffee in containing PFAS potentially. And everyone's like freaking out over. And I'm like, just stop going to Starbucks. Like just stop. It'll save you money. Like you yeah. don't need it. It's non-necessity. Like, I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick funny story about that. When So our offices are in downtown Los Angeles. When we initially started, our offices were in Pasadena and we had a small office and it's just me and my partner. And we used to walk across the the block to our union bank to do all our banking and stuff. And we would always walk in there and make deposits. And they had a great killer little coffee machine for customers to use. And it was like <laughs> really good, you know, all these different brands, you can make cappuccinos. So we'd always get a, get a quick coffee. And then one of the bankers that we used to talk to a lot, his desk was literally five feet away from that coffee and they were allowed to use it. Mm -hmm. and every single time we went in there, he had a Starbucks cup on his, on his desk. <laughs> And me, and me and Miguel were always like, dude, you're throwing your money away. You have this incredible coffee for free from your work. Mm -hmm. And yet every day you go, and he was just like, oh, I know. I'm just, a, I just love Starbucks. And it just, it, it drove us crazy. Because we were like, man, like five <laughs> feet away from you is like delicious coffee. Oh, and this dude's it. spending eight bucks a day on his Starbucks. And, and it's it just, not even good. It doesn't even taste good. I'm sorry. It tastes over roasted. 
Yeah. I can't. I can't. Totally. I can't. Totally. Uh, I know that was a tangent. What, what was well, we I? Were about saying, I was saying paper products. Like oh, yeah, I'm paper hearing pro okay. paper products. So are you know what out. it does? It makes so so phthalates. They put a coating on these paper products to make them waterproof and to make mm. them more resilient. Okay. So so they you know, so whatever. So if you're using a plastic cup or a bowl, it's going to be more waterproof for mm -hmm. you. Or if it's food packaging, you know, it's going to be stronger. Like we we have a I have one of those cases pending with a like Mission tortilla chips, right? Mm. Mission's huge company. They make tortilla chips and some of their chip packaging, you know, has too much PFAS. And, and they, they have the paper there, bags, right? Yeah, the paper bags. There you go. Mm -hmm. and oh, they, shoot. And they use it to make it, you know, just more stronger, right? So they, they last longer. To and make that, the paper bag more strong. Make the okay. pa paper bag stronger so it lasts longer and it won't tear when it's shipped or when you use it or something like that. So that's why a lot of paper products are coated for waterproofing and just to make them more more resilient. And once I, again, had, had California not passed this law about it, you know, we wouldn't know what we wouldn't know what to test for or how to like see if the limits are too high, and we wouldn't be able to bring lawsuits about it. But now mm -hmm. that they passed a law that said you test, and if it's over X amount, you can bring an action. Right? Are you ever representing a victim of any kind, or is it always that you found data to act on? Always data to act on. Just in okay. my practice, in my Got practice, it. it's not. Uh, it's it's I work with environmental groups. Mainly. Okay. And then, and, and the victim angle, it's hard to know, right? Because I would have to have somebody that came to me and said, Hey, I ate this product and then I got, I got cancer, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. we don't know. It's an accumulation of things, right? The reason so many people get cancer is because they're exposed for 30 years to 800,000 different products, <laughs> right? Right. Or the air or the water or whatever. Right. So, so that direct like causal link is very hard. So I couldn't bring a case like that, but it's more about working with environmental groups on a bigger scale. Uh, to test products and get them off the shelves. Or, mm -hmm. you know, if I don't know. I'm sure you've heard of them. Moms Across America is a wonderful advocacy group. Jen Honeycutt heads that. She's always looking at glyphosate exposure and food supplies. They did a school lunch testing program where they privately tested school lunches and found just horrid, horrid results. We've had her on the show twice. Um, Dr. Jenna Hua of Million Marker, she is like a, they sell um, testing kits at home for you to test your own kind of bodily accumulation of toxins. And mm -hmm. she does a lot of work about educating consumers on the everyday products that are, could be harmful to you. I think she's also in California. Um, there's just so many people that we've had on the show before that are echoing what you've said. And I think that that um, is encouraging that we have people approaching the, the, challenge from different angles we've got the consumer education we've got the actual litigators we've got the you know state one singular state that's trying to work hard to make sure we get this information secured but yeah i think that's that's really cool what other questions did you have that's it for me for now yeah i mean i was just interested I, like the the actual like I, I didn't want you to say hey open up the bag of you know the, your, your black book of all the you know <laughs> all the bad people out there but it was just it was just nice for me to kind of get an example of yeah, yeah. So we're we're talking to Target. They've got these these plates, and and here's some of the things that we're finding because, you know, it's so easy for us to sit here and talk about all the bad things, and and then your mind starts racing. You're like, okay, so so now what, right? And and I think you know, there's definitely a trend in in plastic, right? I would say there's a trend in that, and there's also a trend in man being aware of like the food that you're eating, right? And we can't go live in a bubble. Mm -hmm. And being aware that, that I'm eating and I'm ingesting food, even the idea of like, man, I'm working with tools and stuff all day long. And come and wash your hands, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And just some of the practical things that Vinice talked about, I think, is really powerful uh, because you know, wear your gloves. Wear you know? wear your gloves. Yeah, if you're doing with tools. Wear your gloves. You know, yeah. always just put them on. <laughs> you know, just put them on, and that'll yeah. help. That'll help with exposure, right? And wash your hands a ton. You yeah. know, and that's and that's good for you anyway in terms of not getting sick, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> like dovetails, right? Mm -hmm. And how many people are switching from plastic products to paper products, not realizing that there's a coating on their paper stuff, right? Again, it comes down to that convenience. Well, what are like fragrance soaps, right? You got to wash your hands. And are, are we, we talk uh, anything going on there with like fragrance soaps that you're putting, you know, PFAS or, or chemicals or whatnot into your system? Yeah, not, not that we found. So okay. not that I'm involved with or aware of. So For PFAS can't, specifically, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I can't yeah. speak to that. Like I said, some of the shampoos, some of the lotions and sunscreens we found have contained products, but nothing really on soap. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, wonderful. Um, I would love to hear where people can find you, Vineet, because um, I think that your work is so interesting. So if you could tell us a little bit about that before we sign off, that'd be great. Sure, sure. 
uh, cd-lawyers.com. That's our website. Mm-hmm. Uh, CD Law, that's kind of what we go by. We're based in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, I'll have, we, and we have a ton of social media for our law firm. And cool. maybe after this, I'll have Gustavo. He can email you links or whatever. Yeah. I don't know if you guys put that up. Uh, but yeah, but that's about it. CD Law dash, CD dash lawyers.com. And, Wonderful. And look us up. It has all our information, has all the stuff that we do. And if anybody wants to chat with us or, you know, has cases, let us know. Potential cases. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Thank you for taking your time today. This has been a very eye-opening conversation, so I appreciate it. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And once again, you know, don't get too depressed if you listen to this podcast. <laughs> the world is, you know, like, I know it's, 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 it's a depressing subject and it can be kind of scary, you know, but there's things we can all do to keep ourselves safe. And, and you know, like I said, I, I look at the positive things that I have in my life every single day, and, and that kind of keeps me going and keeps me mm -hmm. from getting too skewed or too depressed about things. And mm -hmm. I think everybody should kind of, do that if you can. I love that. Thank you for that reminder too. That's good. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking soon, V. Thank you so much. Yeah, stay in touch, please. You know, anything else we can do or collaborate on or talk about, let me know. This is really interesting. Cool. Love it.